Good. <laughs> and there's Clifton. We won't call him late for dinner. Late for dinner, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Welcome, friends. And Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for being our sovereign Lord, that you first loved us and you sent us your son, Jesus, to die on the cross that we might be saved and reconciled to you, Father. And we thank you for the blood of Jesus. We pray the bloodlines of Jesus and the blood of Jesus over each one of us, our families, our friends, our ministries, our homes, our jobs, whatever you have us to do, Lord, that we do all things with thanksgiving in our heart and praise on our lips, and we do it for your glory, Lord. Bless our time with uh, Brother Eugene today, and we pray for strong internet, no Wi-Fi interruptions, strong bandwidth, and open bandwidth with you in the throne room, Lord, that we could hear your Holy Spirit clearly, and we thank you, Holy Spirit, for abiding in us, and we abide in you, and Lord, help us to grow higher together, to be prepared to discern the times and the seasons and the spirits, Lord, in this day. And we just give you all the glory, praise, and honor in Jesus' mighty, holy, pure name. Thank you, Lord. And welcome, Eugene. Back with uh, back to Jerusalem. Thank you so much for your taking time from your busy schedule to join with us. And we always appreciate your friendship and and your camaraderie and real news. <laughs> There's such a plethora of uh, fake news, of gossip, of media manipulation. And uh, so, Eugene, welcome. Thank you so much, brother. It's always a pleasure to be with you guys. I really feel, uh, I mean, just moved that you guys asked me to come and share. I mean, um, uh, most people kind of chase me out. So I'm, I'm, I feel very fortunate <laughs> that you guys uh, are okay with hearing my form of uh, indoctrination of ministry. Um, there, I mean, I know that there's been a lot of people with their eye on China right now. And before I jump into anything, I just, I want to ask you, uh, Nancy, George, or anybody in the group, are there any questions that you guys are hoping that, you know, me sharing from China, even though I'm not Chinese and I'm not in China at the moment, are there, are there things that you've been hearing, uh, things that you've been seeing in the news that you have questions on? I mean, I've been contacted uh, almost every other minute from pastors and friends and ministers around the world that are just asking me, hey, somebody in my church is sharing this on Facebook, somebody's sharing this information on the news. I was just reading this article today. Uh, is this true? Is that true? Um, do I have to be worried? I'm planning for a trip in Asia uh, next month or during the summer. Uh, is it, do you guys have any questions like that before before I get started? Because I would I would really love to make sure that I'm I'm meeting your needs with the with with what I'm sharing tonight. Or it's nighttime where I'm at, <laughs> so it, 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 so I might refer to it at the, this evening. It's a uh, it's actually just after eight p.m. where I'm at right now. Wonderful. Any questions? I think we want an update. We 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 had foreign students in our home for a number of years, and many of them are from various parts of China. Can mm -hmm. can you share with us how far this virus has spread? I I don't think that we really know right now. Um, I know that Wuhan is the center, but. Um, we are getting reports from Zhengzhou, uh, Hangzhou. Um, this is the center of China. Um, if you look at Wuhan, it is the largest city in central China. So it is, it is kind of right in the heartland of a place that transfers all over China and, and really all over the world. So even though it's not the financial center of uh, Shanghai, it's not the capital city of Beijing, it's not the production center of Shenzhen or Guangzhou, it is, it is basically the crossroads. So Wuhan is the, it, it's kind of like um, Chicago is for the United States. It's smack dab in the middle of China and it's just kind of spread out everywhere. So we have been getting reports as far west as uh, Urumqi and Tibet of people that have um, gotten sick. We've gotten we've we've gotten messages from people in the south in uh, Guangdong province, people in the north in Jilin province. So basically, all over China. 
the problem that China has is that this virus was actually discovered in December of last year. Um, it was at the very beginning of December. And uh, when I started to report about this, I basically said, this is China's Chernobyl. So anybody that has studied about what took place in Chernobyl, um, what you see is the Communist Party. This is common with communism. They tried to clamp down on the news so that nothing would get out that was bad. Uh, the very first signs that they had on the ground in the center of China uh, came from already on December 1st. This means that people were contracted with this disease or contacted this disease in November of last year. And then, of course, most people have heard about um, the doctor who shared on January 3rd um, on his social media. He, along with seven other Chinese, wrote on their social media and, and tried to warn family and friends about what took place. Uh, those, all eight of those individuals that wrote about this were thrown in jail, including this do doctor. And those that were thrown in jail basically contracted the disease and spread the disease in jail uh, because they weren't given proper sanitation. I mean, it's a Chinese jail, right? So, I mean, it's not the cleanest place on earth. And uh, we continue to see that, that those that had the disease in December, those that had the disease and were dying in January, were spreading all around China, traveling around China, giving it to other people. So basically, right now inside of China, everybody's at risk. Now, the center of everything is Wuhan. Uh, today, I think we just passed over um, 11,100 uh, people that have now died from the disease. That is growing by over 100 people per day. And, um, and I'm, I, I think that we're gonna see that jump by even more. Um, we're now seeing roughly 40 to 50,000 people. Those are official numbers. I don't put a lot of faith in those official numbers. I wanna be very careful about people that are saying like 700,000 or a million people infected. I don't think we're there yet. Um, and the reason I say that is because I have a pretty good network throughout China with the churches that I work with, and they have a pretty good feel what it's like in their city. But because China tried to clamp down on people sharing this information and even punishing and throwing in jail medical personnel, doctors, nurses, staff uh, for sharing information, they only made the, the situation worse. They exacerbated the problem, and now it's out of control in China. It really is out of control. The Chinese are doing everything that they can. Now, I'm going to share something that's a little different, and it may not be easy for some people to hear. Um, and you may not agree with what I, what I say this evening, and that's okay. This is just one opinion. Um, I, I can back it up with Bible, but someone can disagree with me and also back it up with Bible. That's the, <laughs> that's the beauty. This is not a salvation essential, what I'm going to be sharing. But I believe that nations that turn their back on God and persecute his people, they find that they suffer. Their, their misery index goes up considerably. Um, I've said this before in this forum. I'm just going to repeat it for those that were not uh, a part of the class in the past when I've shared this or have not read anything that Back to Jerusalem has put out there. But it's something that I believe very strongly in. And that is that when nations turn their back on God, when nations persecute his people, they turn their back on everything that God is. That means they embrace that which God is not. So when they, if the, the Bible tells us in 1 John 4, 7 and 8 that God is love, that he doesn't just love us, but he is love. So therefore, when we reject God, when we reject his people, when we per persecute those that follow after him, we then embrace that which is the opposite of him. So if God is love, when we reject him, we reject love. And there's only really one other option, and that is hate. We, we embrace hate. Uh, God is peace. So when we reject God, we reject peace. And therefore, we are uh, embracing that which is the opposite of peace, which is war. And we see that there is conflict in all of the nations that reject God and persecute his people.
Um, we see that uh, God is life. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. When we reject God, we reject truth. We reject life. We reject all those things, and we accept that which is the opposite. And the more we reject him, the more we're bringing in that which is the opposite. The reason I say that is because I can prove that throughout history, and I can prove that in every single situation that the rejection of Christ as a nation exists and the persecution of his people. Now, of course, that takes, that takes place on different levels. So we see the misery index also take place on different levels. Uh, I don't know if this makes sense. But I can prove it in North Korea, the difference between North Korea and South Korea. I can prove it in Germany, the difference between Eastern Germany under the old Soviet bloc and Western Germany when God's people had freedom. Uh, I can show it in Yemen, Saudi Arabia, even though they're rich with resources, they are poor in every other way possible with all of the resources that they have their money cannot buy them a good education it cannot buy them a good it cannot buy them good medical care it cannot buy them a good economy these things um, suffer because god's people are persecuted two years ago inside of china we saw people being persecuted christians being persecuted like we haven't before. And I've been sharing about this over and over and over, the increase of persecution of the Chinese since 2017. And this is so important because starting in 2018, once we saw the laws that were passed in 2017, 2018 and 2019 were the worst years that I've ever seen for the Chinese Christians since I've lived there in the last two decades. I've been living in China for about 20 years, uh, more than 20 years actually. And so over for more than 20 years, I've never seen persecution against the church in China as it has been. What I saw was persecution go up. And what I also saw was the economy come crashing down. It took wow. a nosedive. And the nosedive, of course, can be explained. The nosedive can be explained because of the Trump policies the trade war. But now that the trade war is resolving itself, the economy in China is shattering even more because now we're seeing this coronavirus. It's crippling the nation in ways that we never thought possible. And we're going to see it around the world as well. I'm surprised we haven't seen it, uh, an impact as much as, as, as much as we have. And I believe the reason why we haven't seen an impact around the world is that the rest of the world is being insulated by the grace of God, by Christians, though being resisted, they're not seeing the persecution. In fact, I would say the church in the West is rising up in a very special way. We've seen persecution against the church in the West. No doubt about it. I'm not going to argue with anybody about that. However, I have never seen video footage at least of the holy spirit raining down in the west wing of of the white house and i've Woo! seen that within the last couple months mm -hmm. i have not seen people pray in the name of the holy ghost with their hands laid upon the president whether you support him or like him or whatever i didn't vote for him so i feel i can speak freely um but i've seen the holy spirit rain down in in the nation of the u.s and in a way that is very special and very favorable. And I feel that it has kept the U.S. from feeling the impact of what China has been feeling in the last two years. China's economy is hurt bad. Uh, we've seen the worst stock performance ever in, in the last 20 years of China. The, so the stock market is taking a nosedive. The unemployment number is through the roof factories are shutting down and leaving China and I'm helping them do that. I'm helping them to move to other nations. George, you were there with me in Vietnam. Vietnam has, a, has an openness that it hasn't seen in generations. I mean, it's still not perfect. I'm not arguing that, but it's getting better. And guess what else is getting better? The economy, the education, uh, we are seeing so many blessings raining down on nations that are blessing God's people. Unfortunately, we are also seeing the tragedy of what happens to nations and governments and policies that attack God's people and come raining down on those that 
try to follow after God's word. Now, in China, we are seeing a, a, a huge impact now. I don't want to use the word plague. I, I don't think that this is on the level of a plague per se, not yet. However, the nation is suffering. And I, I, if you ever get the chance, I'm not going to read it here, but uh, I did, a, I did a, uh, an article on backtojerusalem.com that I put up uh, a few weeks ago from the church in Wuhan where they came out and asked for prayer, but they didn't just ask for prayer. They did something very special. In their letter to the world that they shared with me and asked me to share with the rest of the world, <clears throat> they started off, I, I would say, didn't just start off, but two-thirds to maybe four-fifths of the letter was repentance, begging God to forgive their nation for the persecution that they've brought against his people, begging God to forgive them as a whole for rejecting God and his love and his teaching and his word. It, it, was, a, it was a very moving letter. And I can still see that God is showing his grace upon his people. What is amazing from my perspective so far is that I've seen over 40,000 people tonight as I'm sitting here right now that are reported by the government. And those are the most conservative numbers that you're going to get, numbers from the government. Um, those are the most conservative numbers. And to answer your question or to go back to your original question, yes, people all over China are suffering from contact with this disease. We're now finding that it's the worst. It, it's worse than what we thought before. It was considered that this, um, this di disease would not be transferable in the air. So just by somebody breathing the same air as someone else, you would not necessarily catch it. You would need to make contact with the fluids. Uh, bodily fluids. So if somebody sneezes and that gets on your hands and you don't wash your hands and you touch your eyes or your mouth uh, or you're, you're touching um, doorknobs or elevator buttons or um, guardrails and those are infected. If you touch those and you touch your mouth or somewhere that's exposed, that's how the disease has been spreading. But now they've, dis they've, they've discovered that it's worse than that. It, it is actually an airborne disease. You can get it by simply breathing. That means it is more contagious than SARS. It is about as contagious as the flu, but much more deadly than the flu and more deadly than SARS. Right now, we have about a 2% um, number of people that uh, fatality rate, uh, but that's not a confirmed number. That's very, very low. It's probably higher than that now. Um, but those numbers have spread throughout the country. And the reason I bring that up is this. I have so many church friends inside of China. I'm not saying that Christians have not gotten this disease. But I personally, of all the churches that I know, I don't know of any pastors that have any people in their church that have the disease. Amen. Woo. So e even if there are, and I'm and, and I'm assuming that there are, that's my faith is I'm I'm not I'm I'm not the most uh, you know uh, rah 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 faith champion. Um, I try to be a little bit cautious when I'm sharing this kind of information, but from what I know from all of my pastor friends, and I've been writing to them, pastors that have 10 million people in their church, I've written to them and they said, we don't know of anybody in our church that has the disease. Wow. So that is a huge, Lord. huge miracle. Now, let me also share this. We've just had Chinese New Year. This disease fell on the most important holiday of the Chinese New Year. The Chinese New Year falls at a different time every year. And the reason that it falls at a different time every year is because it is based on the lunar calendar, not, this, the, not the solar calendar. It is very much along the same lines as the Passover festival. That is the largest Jewish festival of the year, the largest Jewish holiday of the year. What is amazing about both the, the Jewish Passover and the Chinese New Year is that both of these holidays are based on the equinox. And the equinox sets the stage for the rest of the year and sets the holidays. And uh, the Chinese never celebrate the, the 
Chinese New Year on the same day because their calendar, like the Jewish calendar, falls on a different day. What is amazing is that the Chinese culture history goes back about 5,000 years, more than 5,000 years, to the year 2700 BC is when we can trace the, the history of Huangdi, the very first emperor of China, the yellow emperor of China. Huangdi praised, prayed to a god called Shangdi. This is the same name that we use for the God that we pray to today, Shangdi. Wow. When I pray to God, I pray to Shangdi. Now, Shangdi is considered to be the Chinese translation for the word Shaddai. And cool. the Shaddai is this, it, it obviously is this word that the, the, the Jews used when they, one of the words, El Shaddai, when they, when they worshiped the, the God of their ancestors. The Chinese also worship the God of their ancestors, which is Shangdi. Shangdi has many similarities between Shaddai. For instance, if you go to the Temple of Heaven, uh, is there anyone here listening that has been to the Temple of Heaven in, in China, in Beijing? Okay, so nobody listening. So I can tell you anything and, and you'll believe it. Um, <laughs> but if you ever go to the Temple of Heaven or if you ever get a chance to go to Beijing, Temple of Heaven is the second most visited uh, location in China, second only behind uh, the Forbidden City and uh, second ahead of the third place, which is uh, the Great Wall of China. The Temple of Heaven is a world UNESCO World Heritage Site. It is the world's largest sacri uh, sacrificial altar, and it was there that sacrifices were made to Shangdi. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. I apologize if I'm taking the long road, uh, but I just feel that this is so powerful when talking about the coronavirus inside of China because it's, it's so much bigger than what we're just looking at in this one little time capsule. So the Chinese worship this god, Shangdi, and this Shangdi um, had many similarities to Shaddai. For instance, I've been all around China. I, I, I travel in China on a regular basis, and I've been to every province and to most of the big cities and a lot of small rural areas that I've, I'll never be to again, and I wouldn't remember their names if they were written on, on the page in front of me. But one of the things that I've noticed about Chinese culture is that all of their gods and goddesses, whether it's Taoism, Confucianism, ancestral worship, or Buddhism, all of their gods and goddesses have faces images, idols. If you walk into any Chinese home, you're going to find their, their idol in their home, the God that they pray to, an idol of Buddha. If you go into a Chinese restaurant, you're bound to see the idol of their family. You're bound to see um, the God that protects their restaurant or their home or their place of business. They, they try to create the feng shui. My son had a real problem with this. My oldest, when he was a little boy, we lived in a very small village. And this village, they, uh, the apartment that we rented was right upstairs above the landowner. And the landowner, outside of his front door, he had a little god that protected his home. And so he lit incense to this god every single day and put fruit on the altar for that god. And his God might have protected him from many things, but it didn't, it didn't protect him from a two-year-old that liked fruit. So my son always went there to get his free fruit. I would try to correct him and say, son, you cannot take fruit from the altar uh, of, this, of this Chinese God. But he always did. <laughs> One of the things that you see is you always see faces of the Chinese God except for the temple of heaven in Beijing that is for Shangdi. There's no pictures, no idols allowed to be made of Shangdi. No image is allowed to be made of Shangdi. This, compare this to Exodus chapter 20, where God commands his people not to make any grave image and pray to it or make any God image and, 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 and pray to it. We see this in Exodus chapter 20. We see this also there in the temple of heaven. Now get this. This is also exciting. The Chinese emperor himself would go there every year and give prayers that I promise you look like they were straight out of the book of Exodus and Levit Leviticus. When I read to them, it sounds like I'm reading from Genesis. Um, when the, when the um, um, 
emperor would go and make his sacrifice. Everything, everything is done in threes. All of the buildings are built in three levels. The layout of the land is done in three parts. The sacrificial altar is done in three levels. There's a trinity to everything there. Now from the altar, there's a sacrifice and the sacrifice is done on a big circle. The big circle has, a, has an X kind of in the middle or it could be looked at as a cross. It's in the middle of that cross that sacrifices are done. The emperor goes from the sacrificial area through what's called the gates of hell because he doesn't return back through them. There's a bridge that connects the altar. Get this. There's a bridge. I wish I could had a whiteboard right now. I would, I would draw it out for you. But there's a bridge that goes between the temple of heaven and the sacrificial altar. Oh. No joke. The oh. emperor walks on the bridge. Beside the bridge is a little hut, a little Chinese house. That house was for the Chinese emperor that would go and fast and pray for three days and three nights. And on the third day, he would <laughs> rise up and then go and make his prayers before Shangdi. It wow. is such powerful imagery that you see. Now, this continues on. This continues on till today. And the, the reason I bring this all up is because this is Chinese New Year, the largest Chinese holiday of the year that coincides with the, the Jewish festival of the Passover. And with the, with the Passover, what was the big thing that we see that all the Jews put on their doors so that the evil spirits would pass by? The blood of the lamb, right? The blood of the lamb was put on all of the doorposts. Every Chinese home, almost every Chinese home, anybody that you know from China, write this down. Ask them if you don't believe me. Travel to China at the end of January to the beginning of March, depending on where the Chinese New Year falls. What you will find is every home with red banners on all of the doorposts on the outside of the house to protect the home from evil spirits that pass by. Christians put Christian red banners on their door to protect them from evil spirits that pass by. I personally feel that the evil spirits of this disease of the coronavirus have passed by the homes that have been marked with the blood of the lamb, mm. and they have been spared during this time. Mm. So we are seeing something that I think is a very powerful time in history and we'll miss it if we don't look at the way that God has moved in the past and compare to what we are seeing today. Can I ask a question? Yes. I, I want to, okay. You're saying Shun Li or Chun Li? How are you saying that? Uh, so yes, I'm, I apologize. I've been talking a little fast and maybe a little bit too much. It's no. Shang Di. So S H A N G. That's the first word. And then the next word is D D I. So Shang Di. So the Chinese characters tell a story, always tell a story, except for words that are foreign. Words that are foreign, the Chinese do not have an alphabet that makes sounds. So what they have to do is they have to find characters that are very similar to those words. So to your ear, Shangdi and Shadai may sound completely different. But if I fly to Chicago, for instance, Chicago is, in Chinese is Jijagu. Now, to the Western ear, that doesn't sound like it's anything close, but actually it is pretty close for a Chinese that listen to Chicago. It, it, it is close for them. If I fly to Los Angeles, I will tell the Chinese I'm flying to Los Angeles. Uh, if I fly to New York, I say New Year. If I, um, if I drink Coca-Cola, I say Coca-Cola. So very similar, but I have to find characters that make those sounds uh, in order because they don't have an alphabet in the same way. Shang Di, yes, go ahead. My question, um, as I looked it up, it means up, right? Shang Di. Um, uh, Shang Shang means to be on top of something, mm -hmm. and Di can be like leader or or God 
or like, so like in heaven. So Shang Di would be mainly, uh, it doesn't really have a meaning, but it can mean above. Okay, so my question, I, I, and I don't want to get you off track because you just stay on track. But when you were, <laughs> were talking, oh my gosh, when you were talking about the, um, to go into heaven and you talked about the bridge and going over to heaven, this is the idea that um, Mike Bickle has for the New Jerusalem versus the, um, uh, the millennial reign about how it's going to hover and you're going to go through the, uh, the, go through Jerusalem, go through the temple in the millennial reign, and you're going to go up into glory into the new Jerusalem. I mean, he has this picture. I, I really want to hear more about it, but I don't want to get you off track. So maybe sometime I can hear that because that is, that is Mike's, Mike Pickle's vision Amen. for the millennial reign and the new Jerusalem. That'll really mess you up. So, I mean, it, it exists. It exists. Yeah. So, so I want to hear more, but I don't want to take you off track. Keep Amen. Going. Keep going. I have a quick question, Eugene. I've heard you speak before about um, Persian evangelists in you know, modern day Iran going to China. Were they there around that time of 2750 BC or did they come later? Yeah, they came much le later. So they came after, after Christ. So um, yeah, so they came around the seventh, uh, the, the fifth century, the fourth century um, uh, AD. Um, Huang Di. Now, so just to kind of not to get too deep in the woods, if you have a piece of paper and you're able to take notes, kind of draw a line. And in that line, at the very top of the line, put 2700 BC. And then down at the bottom, put 2020, where we're at today. In the middle, you can put the year zero. Okay. Um, when you when you do that, what you see is that uh, because a lot of people think, oh well, China that their ancient culture, the religion is Taoist, Confucianist, Buddhist. They're not connected with the Jews in any way. That's a bunch of bullcrap. Actually, they are very closely connected with the Jews, and I'm going to tell you why. Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism. These come around uh, the third century BC. Uh, and this is being very gracious. Buddhism actually didn't come until much later. It was actually the Christians who came in AD who translated the book of Buddha for the Buddhist evangelists so that the Buddhist evangelists could preach. Um, the the um, emperor of China did not like the Buddhists or trust the Buddhist evangelists, but he loved the Christians and gave them freedom to preach. But they came as business people to support themselves. And one of the businesses that they did was translation. So there's actually no argument outside of Tibet. Only if you believe that Tibet is a part of China and it hasn't traditionally been that way, there was no real signs before Christ in China of active Buddhism. However, we'll give it to them. We'll say, okay, it's, it's yours. That's only 300 years. You still have over 2000 years to account for what God did the Chinese serve. Well, it's, there's a very famous historian. His name is Sima Qian. Uh, Sima Qian is the most famous Chinese historian ever to live. Um, he lived about 2,000 years ago, and Sima Qian wrote about the god of ancient China, and he did so in more detail than any other historian before his time. And so he writes about Shang Di. And Shang Di lived, or uh, Shang Di was praised by the original yellow emperor. Um, Huangdi. Huangdi was the original emperor that lived about 2,700 years. So over 2,000 years, the people in China served and gave border sacrifice to Shangdi. Who is Shangdi? Shangdi is the creator of all things. Shangdi created heaven, earth, man, and all that is within them, according to the writings of the Yellow Emperor. Now, if it's true, and I, I tend to believe it is, there is argument about when Huangdi lived, but if it's true that he lived around 2700 BC, that would mean that Huang Di was in a situation where he would have been exposed to the three people who populated the earth with their wives, Shem, Hem, and Jepeth. Shem, Hem, and Jepeth would have no, the, the stories that they would have known would have come from Genesis. And I can sit here all night long, actually, and show you different characters in the Chinese language, different things in the Chinese culture that point to the story of Genesis. Um, 
For instance, almost most homes of older Chinese, for instance, they have what's called the celestial heavenly boat that carried all of the beginning of the world's people. That boat has eight people. Yeah. If you look at the very first boat that we have in the Bible, which is supposed to be the very world's first boat that we've ever seen in humankind, that's the ark. How many people did the ark have? You know, Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their three wives. So if that's true, it means that Huang Di would have very much come from and connected with the, those three sons or their children or their grandchildren. That means that the grandchildren would have been exposed to the information which would have come from Shem, Ham, and Jepheth. We know that Shem, Ham, and Jepheth would have known the stories that they were told by Noah. They didn't have TV and internet, right? So sitting on a boat all day long with nothing else to do but tell stories, a lot of the stories that Noah would have heard that would have come from uh, Adam. Now, Adam did not live during the days of Noah as far as what we know, but we do know that, that Adam lived 900 years. And Methuselah lived 969 years, was it, or something like that? Um, so Methuselah, yeah, so 964 years. So Methuselah would have been in that middle ground where he would have been during the time of Adam and during the time of Noah. That means that the stories of uh, Adam would have easily transferred to the generation of Noah. Noah would have shared those uh, stories verbally with his children, and those would have carried on uh, through folklore into China. So 2,700 years later, we still have signs of Genesis all over the place. Here's a really good one. I can't show you Chinese characters, but let me just explain one to you, which I think is really powerful. The very first murder that we see in the Bible is when? With, we, we see it with Cain and Abel, right? Cain and Abel, yeah, Cain and Abel. So when we see the murder, the murder is with who? Two brothers. Mm -hmm. Get this, the word in Chinese for, for brother is xiong. You can say either di xiong, which means like Christian brother, it's a word we use for Christian brother, or you can say xiong di, which is like, you know, my brother, my, my brother from another mother kind of brother. So we, yeah. we use this all the time, xiong di and di xiong. Xiong is the word for brother. The word for murderer is xiong, the same sounding word, but the character is different. The character for brother is a man with a big head. The word for murderer is a man, a brother with a mark on his head. That's the only difference. So you have this story that is, you can see in the beginning, you can say, oh, it's just a coincidence. But the beautiful thing about anybody that tries to piece together stories where the information may not be completely there in front of you, any investigator knows that you collect all the evidence that you can. And if there's only a couple coincidences, that may not really lead to anything. But when you have a series of coincidences, soon you're no longer working with coincidences, but facts that have created a lot of data that are now available to you. And that's what we see inside of China. So inside of China today, with the persecution against the Christians, what we see is Christians that are not turning their back on Chinese culture to follow after God. We see a Chinese people that are going back to the original roots of the very first Chinese that worshiped and prayed to Shangdi. And today we worship and pray to Shangdi. But the government does not want the people to pray and worship to Shangdi. So in the last two years, they've come raining down with this uh, new rule of terror to persecute Chinese, to arrest Chinese, and to remove them from their Christian practice or their practice of following after God. As a result, we have seen the, the, the country come under a self-inflicted attack, mm -hmm. not from the outside, but from the inside. The economy is crashing. We are seeing that the education, the medical, I mean, right now the, med the medical field is under com complete attack because hospitals are overwhelmed. Doctors are being threatened. Right now, if you write anything, and put it up on social media as a medical, as a doctor, as a medical uh, personnel, as a nurse. If you put anything up on your social media about that criticizes the government's current handling of this coronavirus, you are facing five to seven years in prison. 
Wow. And this only makes the situation worse because then people are shared. And by the way, um, you can be charged with this prison sentence even if you send the message in a private messenger. So it doesn't have to be for everybody to see. If you send a private message to your family and tell them, don't come to this area, don't come to the city, it's really bad right now. Um, the, the way I was just treated by the police, the way I was just treated by the government, the way I was just treated by the border guard, um, if you write that in a private message, you can be prosecuted. Yeah. It's so finally this, this year of our election to help people wake up to not vote for socialism or communism in this country too. Yeah. Hopefully the Americans can get it. The, the, the challenge that I personally have with socialism is not the government structure. I could, I seriously, I could stink and care less what government structure you have as long as God's people have freedom to preach his word and chase after him. That's really, that's really all I care about. However, it is on almost every situation, the more socialist a country gets, the more anti-Semitic that nation becomes. Yes. And the, the more socialist you become down into communism, once you start getting into communism, then you start moving into very anti-Semitic territory. And I don't know why, but socialism and anti-Semitism go so closely hand in hand. Yeah. I, I see it in North Korea. I see it in Laos, Vietnam, when Ethiopia switched over uh, into um, communism for only a short time, they suffered and they suffered bad, but now they've climbed their way out of it. Uh, when we see even where I'm at right now in Sweden, with Sweden becoming more socialist, there was more anti-Semitism. The less socialist that Sweden has become, which they have uh, become much less socialist in the in the recent years. You see much less anti-Semitism. Um, that the two go hand in hand, and 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 it's not just socialism. It's anything where the enemy attacks God's people, and so that doesn't matter whether it's Islam, what we see in Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, Iran, or whether it's Hinduism, what we see in India with radical Hindus attacking God's people, or whether it's Buddhism with our Christian brothers and sisters taking beatings uh, in Tibet from uh, believers uh, that are Buddhist. Um, any, any questions? I know that I've covered a lot of information, but I really, uh, I, I can keep going all night and I would love to answer like any questions or concerns or things where you guys, I, please feel, I think that we learn best when we're in an environment where people disagree. Um, I encourage people, like, I don't know how many people here have heard about the Chasing Revival series that we put out about a year and a half ago, um, but I did a 61-day Bible study series broken down into nine weeks specifically for arguing with one another at Bible st studies. Um, um, we, we actually do that in, um, in the master class. We actually put that out there for the students, but, but definitely share it. That's great. That it, I, I love it when people go through that. It's a great course. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Uh, and, and some of the stuff in there that, that I, I write, um, I don't even know if I agree with what I wrote during the, the time that I wrote it. And the reason, the reason why is I had to go where the facts led us. And, and one of the things that people will see if they ever do that is some areas are short, some areas are long, even though it's broken down into nine weeks, it's not nine even weeks. And the reason why we did that is we only wanted to do what we were inspired to do no more, no less. I've done so many books for publishers around the world where, you know, every day you have to write so many thousands of words, um, you know, for the entire book. Uh, you have to write so many hundreds of words for each day of a Bible study, and you have to do a perfect 30 days or a perfect 40 days or a perfect um, 60 days. And, uh, and so you're in this you're in this little frame where if you have nothing else to say, you better make it up. And if you have so much more to say, but you've run out of room, you have to cut off, I think, vital information. So we just wanted to do a Bible study where we had more freedom to just go for it and, uh, and, and cause you know, controversy. Um, not controversy for the sake of controversy. Please don't hear me say that. But controversy in the way that um, some Bible studies today can sometimes just share information, I think, that... Uh, many of us can read and go through, and at the end of it, we walk away saying, oh, yeah, God is good. God is great. And everybody agrees. 
and usually everybody in the same room from different generations, different cultures, different uh, backgrounds, everybody agreeing uh, is usually the first sign of nobody really dug deep. Because if you dig deep, oftentimes people come to different conclusions. That's why I love the Bible. The Bible had you know, disciples who followed after Jesus that disagreed and disagreed strongly. Um, whether it's uh, we, with Peter and Barnabas, uh, whether it's with, uh, I'm sorry, with Paul and Barnabas, whether it's with Peter and Paul, uh, we see very strong disagreements where people are forced to dig down deep into God's word and to fast and pray to find out what God really wants from them. And I am totally fine with being wrong. We write our Bible studies in a way where we learn, not where we have to be right. Um, I often ask myself, if I would have lived during the days of Jesus, would I have been a Pharisee where I am so hell bent on being right that I miss the truth? that the truth is presented in front of me, but I reject it, not because there it's right or wrong, but because I have to defend my view. And I think as Christians, sometimes we get so into defending our view that we miss the truth that God has for us. And I That's think one that- one of the we, signs of the religious spirit is yes, having to be right all the time. Yes, having to be right all the time. And that is a also, I think, a very prideful spirit, one in which we do not want to humble ourselves before man and before God, uh, humble ourselves to say, God, I know absolutely jack squat. I need all of your help to help me understand what it is that I'm reading. And if what I think I know goes against what your word says, rip it out at the roots and, and allow myself to be crucified in the flesh with that. The word yeah. is a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. And you know, if it cuts both ways, that means that I can be deeply wounded by the truth. Uh, I just heard somebody today say something very interesting. It said, the truth will set you free, but not before it has its way with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. uh, Clifton uh, Gadball, who's been to the Temple of Heaven in China, I think he's the only one that said he had had a question. What about reports of the mass burning of bodies in Wuhan? You know, I saw the other day a, a satellite picture from space, don't know if it's real or fake, but showed uh, you know the intense heat and this one scientist said it was from carbon dioxide, which possibly could be from burning the bodies. Yeah. Um, uh, from the guys that I'm connected to on the ground, I don't, I'm not saying it hasn't happened, but I don't see it as possible um, that, uh, that as many as 50,000 bodies have been burned. Um, it could have happened, but I, I would think that if it has, I would know about it just because my friends would have, I mean, China is a big city. And when you're talking about the city of Wuhan, you're talking about millions and millions of people. However, word does get around. We don't have the term Chinese telephone for no reason. I would have gotten some version of it, even if it was the wrong version. One of the things that I think I would be very um, astute about watching, though, is there is a whistleblower um, that has been with, um, who was the campaign director for President Trump? Oh, uh, oh, Kelly Conway? No, 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 the guy that uh, basically is a big Breitbart name. Um, you, he's the China expert. Oh, or Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon, yes, thank you. So okay. Steve Bannon, he, Steve Bannon knows his stuff when it comes to China. Uh, yeah. His background is actually in, um, in the secret, in, in, in the the uh, sub, sub submarine uh, warfare and naval warfare um he patrolled uh the pacific um so he's he from the his first day of putting on his butter bars as an officer uh, in the navy uh he was studying china and and working with intelligence on china he's probably one of the most knowledgeable people um in the news world today on china i would take what he says very serious he has a whistleblower that came on with him and said the very same thing that you know there's been over 50,000 people that have died from this disease inside of china so far um i don't discount what he says but i can't completely embrace it either because i don't have independent sources on the ground that i work with 
um, clarifying that form. So right now I go with official sources, um, but I know that the official sources are wrong. Um, but when somebody like the whistleblower that spoke with Steve Bannon uh, just two days ago, you can find that on YouTube, or maybe it's still on YouTube. I watched it. Uh, my, my jaw was on the floor. Um, I take it uh, very seriously. And uh, I believe that he believes what he's saying. I don't believe that he's trying to be, I don't think he's being dramatic or trying to drum up emotion. Um, I really believe that the Chinese guy that was reporting, that's what he believes. But I don't, I would not necessarily say that he's correct. So my view on this situation is that uh, the, there has not been 50,000. And if I find out later that I was wrong, I will, I will put it up on the Back to Jerusalem website. But at the moment, we have no indicators on the ground um, that there have been that many people that have died. We do, right. do know that the hospitals are full. They're packed to capacity. We also know that all medicines that have anything to do with flu symptoms have been taken off the shelves. Um, so they do not want people self-medicating right now inside of China. It's only getting worse. The way that they're handling this is only getting worse. I don't know if you guys have seen, but the Chinese authorities have been going door to door kicking in doors, dragging people out of their homes, being suspected of having contact with infected individuals. And they're taking these people and putting them in jail-like settings, which means that they have some, in many cases, no access to running water, no access to sanitation uh, towels or napkins, uh, no access to clean masks or medical masks, no... Um, uh, access to disinfectants and things to wash their hands, no access to medicines. So every, if you didn't have it before you were arrested and taken in, you're probably going to have it if you leave from those detention facilities. Eugene, uh, Peggy had a question. Any thoughts on if this disease was a leak from a bioweapons plant in Wuhan? I tend to believe it was. Um, and, and it's all circumstantial. The reason why is that there are several very meaningful reports that came out by Chinese medical personnel that researched, and they could find no link between the very first or the earliest, those that showed the earliest indication of infection. In China, there were people that were followed up on where did they get the, the, the disease. Those that were, showed the earliest signs had zero link to the fresh meat market in Wuhan. Right. I had read, and who knows if this is true or not, the Lord knows, uh, that a patent was applied for in the U.S. for the a version of the coronavirus in 2015, and the patent was approved in 2018. Have you heard about that? Uh, I, I have. Um, I don't know any. When it comes to patents and stuff like that, I am not sure. But I do know for a fact that China's only uh, bio research center for these kind of viruses, like the SARS virus, like the coronavirus, the only registered location for the research bi bio lab was in China. In 2017, American scientists came out. You can find this. Uh, right now, if you Google it, I, I, I would humbly request that you don't do, use Google as your search engine when searching the coronavirus. If you have a computer in front of you right now, test and see what I'm saying. Put in the coronavirus. When you look at the very first page, the very first page is loaded with CDC and WHO information. You'll have maybe some news things at the top from the New York Times or Bloomberg or uh, uh, financial news, but underneath that in the search bars, you go through all the way down the first page and maybe even into the second and third page, um, what you'll find is CDC information and WHO information. So which there, route do you recommend to use to get some real facts outside of the U.S.? Yep. The, the reason why they are doing that is because everybody's handling China right now with kid gloves. The right. CDT is not reporting the true situation. WHO is not reporting the true situation. They're not lying, but they're being right. very, very careful about what they say because they don't want to offend China. If they offend China, China will cut them out of the process of what they're going through right now. And if they cut them out, it could actually make the problem even worse around the world. 
Uh, by the way, does anybody here that is listening, do you guys know how we first heard about the coronavirus? We first heard about it because there was a woman from Wuhan that was taken into the emergency room and treated in Thailand. And it, the Thai were the first ones to discover that this is something off. She comes from China. And they're in there. So this happened mid January. The very next day was when the WHO released information about this disease. The WHO actually knew before, but they did not release earlier because they did not want to offend China. Um, so China, China can play hardball. They will remember who crosses them. They've already made threats. The China Daily, which is the official mouthpiece of the Chinese government, has already said, we will remember the nations that close their border to the Chinese. And so they're already making threats. So there are people in Singapore that are scared about what will happen when China, uh, when this gets better. Um, but the, tr but the, the thing is, is that in 2017, going back to the Wuhan bio, um, research facility, uh, American, um, and you can, you can research this. If you go to like, uh, duck, duck, go or something like that, you'll be able to find, um, the, these 2017, um, um, <clears throat> articles where, U.S. scientists warned the world that China should not, they don't have the uh, safety measures in place, nor do they have uh, practices in place for handling safely deadly diseases. So it's this very disease that they're researching in Wuhan, and it's this very disease that is, that it's, the, Wuhan is the epicenter. That's why I said this is, this is China's Chernobyl. Um, <clears throat> already more people have died. Um, like something like eight times more people have died so far from this virus than died in Chernobyl. Yeah. yeah. Um, so and it's way and, more than SARS too, right? Like many times. Way more, more than SARS. Way more than SARS. Yes. Um, and and the total body count for SARS was um was over a period of two years. This right. is just getting started. We're only in the second month. And yeah, we've already a friend in Taiwan sent me a link that uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization, for those who don't know, they won't even recognize Taiwan as a separate country because they're, they're like in the pockets of China almost, um, or the UN, probably more so the UN. Yeah, definitely the UN. And so, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the current situation inside of China. Um, we're seeing roughly about 100 people die per day, uh, a little bit more, a little bit less. That number is growing. Uh, about th more than 3,000 people are becoming and that are getting infected every day. That was from two days ago. That number has now grown. We're seeing more people infected every day uh, than we were before. So these are, th this is the current situation inside of China. And we just pray that you continue to pray for the church. Now, Amen. as we as we pray for the church, um, there there is something that I would like to share that doesn't have to do with the coronavirus per se. But before I move on to that, I just wanted to ask you guys if there's anything, or are, are there any other questions that yeah, you... Yeah, Stefania. Yeah, Stefania just asked, what about the help from the nations to China now? Are they accepting it? I know a few weeks ago they weren't. Uh, what do you have to update on that, Eugene? Yeah, I'm so glad that you asked that. So we've been helping, we've been sending in uh, aid, but um, China is uh, the part of their crackdown in China on Christians is also cracking down where Christians have been the most influential. And where have Christians in China been the most influential? During disasters. Mm -hmm. Whenever there's a disaster that hits, Christians, those that love Christ, do everything that they can to reach out and help those that are in need. Now, what that has done is a lot of people have seen, wow, wait a minute, you know, I thought under the Communist Party, everybody was equal and everybody was supposed to be helped. But actually, communism is inseparable from atheism. And with atheism, it's about what can help me. And if you don't believe that, just look at the practice. We don't see a lot of atheist groups in disaster areas putting their life at risk to help those in need. What you do see, though, are a lot of Christians. 
Mm -hmm. And so Christians have been extremely influential over the years. I know this personally because since 1996, I've been running a humanitarian organization inside of China. So we have a humanitarian organization that's been running inside of China since 1996 for the very first time starting last year, um, all humanitarian organizations that had outside in, uh, outside funding were banned from working inside of China for fear of them being influenced by Chinese, uh, by, by Christians. So now we see Chinese that are Christians that are going and helping and delivering the aid that we are sending in. And we're sending in the aid basically illegally. So it's not legal. The aid that we're sending in is not legal. Medicines, medications, face masks, face masks are the number one thing that we're sending in. So far we've sent in about 30,000 face masks and we've asked people from all over the world, to if they can, if they got access to extra face masks, send them to us and we will get them to the people inside of China. In order to get the face masks to the people inside of China, we've had to go through uh, quarantine guards. Now those are in place for very simple reasons uh, to keep infections from going in and outside of certain cities. So we've seen several cities inside of China that have been quarantined, blocked off, and that is so that the people inside the city don't spread the disease outside the city and so that people outside of the city don't bring diseases inside the city. So it's just to restrict travel. However, what we have seen is once we get our goods inside the disaster area, we've got, I've got video footage on my phone sent to me directly from Wuhan where our brothers and sisters have been preaching the gospel, sharing about the love of Christ, in this time when people desperately need hope, yeah. handing out aid to those that need it. And so many people are relieved to get this hope. I mean, they're, they're going through mental anguish of fear. What's going to happen to my children? What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my family? What's going to happen to my elderly parents? What's going to happen to our, our home? Because I can't pay for anything. I don't have a job. I can't go to work. Uh, none of the businesses are open. Even if I do have money, I can't buy bread. There's all of these fears that are constantly attacking. People are in a heightened state of high anxiety right now. And there, and here's, here's the double whammy. If you have a heart attack because of your anxiety level, if you have high blood pressure and you have a stroke, there's no room for you at the hospital. You can't go to the hospital for an emergency right now because all the rooms are taken. All the doctors, nurses, and staff are wearing biohazard suits. And so you're going to die outside of the door, not just from the disease, but from the effect of those, this disease. Do you know how the, much the people are begging? for comfort right. from somebody who comes and brings hope. So the Chinese are coming to bring hope and the Chinese police are arresting them. Mm -hmm. I'm, getting, I'm getting messages from my friends saying, uh, sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. I, 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 almost every other day I'm getting messages uh, from people inside of Wuhan, the main city, that Christians that are being arrested and all of their aid is being confiscated and we don't know if it's being given out or destroyed or what so the the chinese are continue to shoot themselves in the foot where else are you getting free aid and very right. few people are qualified like christians christians are usually some of the most qualified um people on the ground on the front lines and they give their services for free whether they're doctors nurses medical staffs or just uh, higher than average educated individuals. And so they're there to help and their help is so desperately desired and wanted by the locals. But the Chinese know this is dangerous because once this disease, the, 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 the problem for this disease has passed us, the long-term impact of this Christian message is going to linger with us for years. That's why China has seen so many people come to Christ and to stop it, the Chinese government is attacking not just churches, not just Christians, but the aid that they provide. Amen. Uh, Jan Willem from the Netherlands had a question. What's the uh, uh, rationale behind that of, of them confiscating stuff? Probably they're keeping the aid for themselves or the police or the military. And then Nancy had a question. So, what, so is that what you think it is, uh, Eugene? Yeah, so they're confiscating it so that um, it doesn't get, go out and it doesn't get spread with the gospel. And people don't get, people then get to see if they do keep it, 
They either keep it for themselves, which is very common, uh, common in a communist society where corruption runs rampant and people, in, 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 they, they, um, everybody is trying to look out for themselves. Um, so they may keep it for themselves. They may actually sell it. Um, I've been in many environments where that, that's the case, where we provide aid in a disaster zone and that aid is sold. I, you know, I've been in North Korea, working inside North Korea, where I've gone to restaurants where um, uh, I've been feeding the hungry people all during the day. And then in the evening, I would go to a local restaurant in order to get something to eat for the evening. And I would see that the rice that they're using and the oil that they're using were provided by USA, sold to the restaurants and then sold to me. Um, We've seen that before too in Bolivia. We shipped a 40 foot container of uh, dental office and a dental lab equipment down there. And our friends' church members loaded it uh, off of one cargo container to another one, and then they never saw it again. They just did the manual labor for the government and the government confiscated it. Yeah, uh, here's the thing, not all cultures are the same. Um, it, we, we, live in an, we live in an environment where people try to sell us this idea that all religions kind of lead to the same place. We're all somehow good down deep inside, um, which is simply not true. We are all naturally evil deep down inside. And given over to our own vice, we actually will do really hideous, bad things to one another. And when we look at different cultures, we see that different cultures will steal from aid and keep it from other people. Not because those cultures are bad. If, let me just look at North Korea and South Korea. South Korea. South Koreans are very giving people. They give a lot. North Koreans will steal anything that they can when it comes to aid. I mean, they're the largest printer of U.S. dollars in the world. They, pre they print uh, massive amounts of U.S. dollars, $100 bills on a regular basis. Uh, they use slaves in order to bring in income for their country. And any aid that is donated, they give out to the army first, and then they sell to their people. Um, the reason why is because they have been indoctrinated by a religion that is antichrist. And that, that permeates every culture and, and people group in the world, regardless of who you are. It doesn't matter what nation you come from. I'm in Sweden right now. People usually think of the Swedes as being nice, kind, loving, uh, you know, socialist, general people, quiet, giving. It, they were the furthest from it. Um, and during the days of the Vikings, they were cruel, evil, brutal individuals that raped, pillaged, stole, and didn't think a thing of it. It was the gospel that transformed the nation. It was the gospel that transformed the culture, nothing else. A lot of people like to think that, well, if they were more educated, um, that would keep people from treating one in individuals bad. I just listened to this wonderful podcast about this uh, amazing believer. He's black and he was the only black man that we know of that wrote a book about the KKK from inside the KKK. If you ever, I can't remember his name, but it's a phenomenal story. He actually uh, led many uh, KKK leaders away and they, they, they walked away. But in the interview that he was in, it, the, the host was saying, yeah, people just need to be more educated. I'm like, yeah, they do need to be more educated on God's word. Education alone does not help you to keep from stealing from other people, from um, uh, being racist towards other people, from just being a generally horrible individual. Um, the Japanese were very educated individuals. The Nazis were very educated individuals. It was the gospel that transforms the heart from the inside. And with that being said, that I do not trust aid that comes from Christians in the hands of non-Christians to do the distribution. So for us, we will only do distribution of Christian aid in the hands of fellow Christians uh, mm -hmm. together with those Christians because we see it over and over and over aid. So for instance, if you go to Muslim countries like 
in some of the more um, Muslim areas of Sudan or Congo or Nigeria, um, where aid is being handed out. What we are seeing is uh, people that are part of the United Nation peacekeeping troops that are handing out aid coming from Christian countries is being used to manipulate women into uh, gives, giving sexual favors for food, for resources, for supplies, uh, being raped and beaten and abused. We're seeing Christians being kept from these materials, not being allowed to have access to this distribution because they're in the hands of Muslims or communists or uh, uh, Buddhists or Hindus. Um, it's not all the same. I know this is very difficult to hear. Again, you may not agree with me. That's totally fine. Um, but this is not a this is not a popular thing to say in 2020. But it's what we see on the ground on a regular basis. Well, I, I've got a question. You're um, what about the tra what do you know about the trade because um, it's really it seems to be um, affecting every country because we do so many imports America does and I think other countries do so I think um, what I'm reading too is that um, it's hurting Germany it's hurting England um, just all these different countries um, do you know anything about that because there's having to shut a lot of the, that down right now <laughs> It goes back to the theory of what I was saying, persecute Christians and everything suffers. Um, what we are seeing is more, we are seeing something today that I could not have predicted. So I, please, if, I, if, I, if you ask me to predict anything into the future about China, I'm going to get it wrong. So if you can, if you got money in your pocket to make any sort of investments, find out what I'm saying about the future and bet the exact opposite and you'll probably <laughs> So when the trade war first started between America and China, I predicted America would suffer more than China. The reason I predicted that is because China holds so much U.S. debt. The reason I predicted that is because China produces almost everything that America consumes. The reason I predicted that is because China has so much outside influence with other nations that they can actually push through legislation even in the United Nations against the US because of their financial resources and investments in other countries, their influence with other countries, and their military prowess. And we, nobody wants to really go to war with China right now. I mean, Russia, you hear all this stuff about Russia. Trust me, Russia is not as big of a threat as China is. Iran, Iran is a, it, it, Believe me when I say Iran does not a w want a war with the U.S. Everything they're doing is saber rattling. Um, the, the, their economy is way too small. In Russia altogether, their economy is about the size of California. Their military is old and decrepit and falling apart. China is cutting edge. They have the funds to back up their muscle, and they have guys, they have a lot more guys than they have women. They have a huge imbalance right now because of their one-child policy. They would enjoy a, a, a battle where they lose a bunch of guys because the imbalance is, is so much. So they have people to literally become bullet sponges. The reason I bring that up is because all of the things that I thought would happen to the US for pulling the trade war stunt did not happen. In fact, China suffered, America grew. America began to grow out of their reliance upon China. It, this is, the trade war has been going on for almost two years now. And right. so in that two years, the Chinese economy has been suffering a lot. In those two years before the trade war started, Chinese, Chinese overhead has become a lot more expensive. So many factories were already looking at moving out of China. Yeah. Uh, income for local Chinese workers has gone up. The overhead for Chinese uh, water and electricity and all of those things has gone up. Um, the overhead for land, because so many people have been building these big factories, has gone up. So people have already been looking at ways that they can save money because China is not as cheap as it was a couple years ago. Even for Back to Jerusalem, our own organization, we've shifted our focus of production out of China into other countries because China is no longer financially viable as a competitive market on producing cheap goods. Wow. What we saw in the U.S. is that many of the companies that have been providing cheap stuff to the U.S. have shifted a lot of their focus into Vietnam and are shifting their focus today into Vietnam, Cambodia, South Korea, and even going back to the United States. 
The United States for the very first time uh, has become energy independent. That's, a, that's huge. I never thought I would see that in my lifetime. That means that China has a grip on the Middle East. The U.S. before, when we were, when, when we were uh, subjected to changes in the Middle East, we would have to watch what we do to China so that China doesn't squeeze us in the Middle East with our addiction to oil that primarily came from the Middle East. We, we're not in that situation any longer. Um, we have more countries that have invested in the U.S. in taking out U.S. Uh, or put into their own treasuries, U.S. dollars. Um, this has taken away the center stage and the power of China. Other countries, however, have not been so wise as, or even luck. You can call it wisdom. You can call it luck. You can call it, well, that's the road it was going anyway. It doesn't really matter. Everybody said that China was going to be the world's largest economy in the year 2020s. That's no longer even on the table. They're so far behind. Um, when we see Europe, now just look at Europe. When we see Europe, Europe has been increasing in their persecution of Christians and their economies, I believe, are a lot more vulnerable than the U.S. economy. The U.S. economy has been doing something remarkable, which is growing kind of in a bubble. It, we don't, we, in the, today's world economy, we don't see that. So to go to your original, um, what, what, you just talk, what you just said, Nancy, I would have to say, yes, Europe is going to feel it. I still feel that we might feel it in the U.S., but so far I'm not seeing any signs. I'm not seeing any signs of us really having an impact. Americans have more money today than what they did two years ago to spend on things that are not made in China. There's also a growing, there's a growing uh, uh, feeling of people want to buy locally. And that's everywhere. And I think that that's really healthy. So, for instance, um, for... Um, um, Valentine's Day, I'm going to take my wife to a restaurant. There's, I'm in a really rural area. We have like one restaurant. So I'm going to take her to one restaurant we have in town, right? And that one restaurant is really cool because they have one menu. And that menu, when you look at the menu, it's like um, the beef is grown by, you know, Jed down the road. The fish was caught by Tom yesterday. Um, the butter was made by Susan from her cows, you know, Jed's cows. So everything all of the um, all of the sauces, all of the the uh, uh, ingredients of every single thing they have on the menu is made from local ingredients, and I think that there's a growing trend for that. That might save Europe a little bit, but not if Europe doesn't change the way in which they've been actually challenging, uh, persecuting Christians. And I've seen that grow. I've seen Christians grow bolder in Europe as well. Some Europeans that are on here might disagree, but I mean, Brexit was a huge wake-up call for the, the idea of having one rule that came down hard for Christians and let everybody else have more power. Yes, Christians are certainly uh, awakening and rising and I think linking together across Europe. We have some great friends on the line here, but uh, we're excited about what the Lord is doing in Europe. And back to... Uh, oil and energy, the U.S. is now the largest exporter around the world. And I had a question, Eugene, that we saw a report a few days ago, again, true or not, um, about like 90% of the uh, antibiotics in the West come from China, and they've already started to um, uh, strip down or, or, the, or reduce the number of exports from China to America of antibiotics, amoxicillin, and other things. Have you Heard, what do you know about that? Yeah, um, one of the things that I always try to do when I look at where my medicine comes from is I try to stay away from things that come from China. Yeah, um, Chinese, <laughs> yeah, Chinese, Chinese, uh, Chinese businesses because of the communist mentality. Please yeah. understand this because this is not racist. Because it is the I I I told people many times if you set me beside a Pakistani, a Christian, and an American. If I'm sitting beside an American that is not a Christian and I'm sitting beside a Pakistani and a Chinese that are Christians, I will share more in common with them on values, on, uh, on, on, on um, ideas of what I want for my children and my life. I will share more in common with them than I will with somebody from my own language, country, and culture. 
um, because I strive to not have an American culture, but a kingdom culture. kingdom culture. And when we leave the kingdom culture, what happens in that kingdom culture is that we are brought to a different level when it comes to integrity. We have a different, different system of values. So when I see, and I work with Chinese factories all the time. I work with Chinese companies all the time. In fact, this year, we're going to be doing a series as, of a business as mission. And I would love some time in the future maybe to share about Chinese business as mission as in, in a series because it is so important for ministry. Um, when I work with Chinese businesses, you have to always be on guard because you are being cheated at every single corner. And I would not want to put anything in my body that is produced inside of China just because I know what Chinese put in their medic, uh, put in everything if they can save money. So for instance, <clears throat> If you, anybody here has been to China, if, you, if, if you've ever been to Hong Kong, you can look this up. It might sound like I'm lying. Trust me, this is, this is true. This is a thing. It is illegal to smuggle baby formula from Hong Kong into China. Not because China doesn't want it, but because Hong Kong won't allow it to leave. Hong Kong went out of baby formula. They went on its big shortage because so many people in China only want their medicine and especially their baby formula from China. Why? Because there are Chinese companies that try to copy U.S. baby formula or European baby formula companies. They'll copy their name and everything. Or maybe they'll even make their own name and say, well, you know, we make it just as good, but uh, we do it for a cheaper price. They have made their baby formula with chalk and sugar. Oh, Jesus. Where oh. So, so many babies have died. As a result, their heads swell up and they die. Uh, this is a huge fear for parents all around uh, China because this is common. This is very, very common. Medicines um, are basically uh, nothing more than, than empty tablets. Um, even when we bring in cattle and, and pork from China, it's, it's absolutely horrible what they do. They will take water hoses and shove them down the throats of the pigs and the, and the, and the cattle, and they'll turn on the water full blast, and they'll feel, fill these cattle and, the, and, the, and, their, and their pigs up with water so that they will weigh more on the scale and sell for a higher price when they come to the Hong Kong market. Um, and so we personally, I personally, would, would already try to steer clear from those medicines made in China. Chinese won't buy Chinese made medicines. That should tell you something about Chinese medicines. Hey, uh, Eugene, um, give us an update on, we've heard reports of up to a million or more um, prisoners put in concentration camps, including the, the Ogres and other minority tribes, Christians, political protesters, and even Muslims too. What's the latest on that? And then I wanna unmute the, the, uh, everybody so that you can ask questions and just uh, wave flags, stand up, raise your hands, or text a question. Well, maybe maybe just um, when you have a question, unmute and ask, and then re-mute so that we can hear right. Eugene. Keep the uh, background noise yeah. to a minimum. Yeah, go ahead, Eugene, on the uh, prison, <laughs> yeah. prisoner in the camps. So um, I, I would say from my exposure on the ground, those reports are true. There are well over a million people that have been taken to concentration camps, re-education camps. Um, in these re-education camps, um, there's no religious material allowed. Children and their families are forced to sing, repeat, learn communist songs, communist history, communist leaders. Um, they, have to re they have to repeat the propaganda. They're brainwashed. These are very similar to the concentration camps that were started up in the 1950s and 60s during the Great Leap Forward. More people died inside of China during that time than at any other time in history. Uh, we saw at least uh, 10 million people die during the first couple of years of the Great Leap Forward. Over 70 million people died under the reign of Mao Zedong. That may not sound like a lot of people. I mean, 70 million, of course, but sometimes numbers can kind of get lost in our heads. I'm in Sweden right now. 70 million people is like killing everybody in Sweden and bringing them back to life nine times to do it again. Wow. And the, the number of people in China, and get this, the things that happened during the Holocaust inside of Europe, horrible, 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 horrible. 
And our feeling is let's build museums, let's build statues, let's put it in our history books. Let's not forget. Let's never forget what, what, what we are capable of. In China, there's not one monument, there's not one museum. Around the world, there's not one icon that we can look to to help us remember the 70 million people that died in China from Mao Zedong and the Great Leap Forward. The Great Leap Forward was this time when they wanted to get rid of the old and bring in the new. Well, what was the old? The old was attack on old culture, old religion, old way of thinking, and to bring in the new way of thinking. So what we see today in the West of these enlightened minds, it's not necessarily new. The idea of attacking uh, sculptures and history books, and we're actually seeing um, an attack on history in the way that we saw in China in the 1950s. In 1949, when Mao Zedong came to power, when he came to power, the first thing that he did is he launched this, these uh, warriors all across. And these warriors were who? They were called the Red Army, but they weren't a real army. They weren't a trained army. They were volunteer, passionate students. They wore red bands on their arm. And they were just followers of Mao Zedong, and they were believers in Marxism and what Karl Marx wrote, and they were passionate about their beliefs, and they believed that they had to get rid of all of these things. And if people didn't agree, then the only way that they could do it was by bringing about violence because the upper echelon controlled everybody else, so they had to tear down that system. What that involved in practice was uh, Christian Bibles, hymnals, um, teaching books being thrown into big bonfires by the cultural police and the cultural army being put into piles, set on fire and burned. Mm. Also, the stuff that I shared with you about China, the Chinese don't want the people to really know the real history of China because the real history will lead them back to the one true God where their history stems out from. So with that one true God, by getting rid of Chinese history, you're getting rid of God in Chinese history. So they right. wanted to burn it. They wanted to burn all of that. We're seeing that today on a much bigger level, but it's not burning in the same way. You see, uh, big IT companies like Google began to take these amazing initiatives and go around copying books, photocopying them, and making them available for the entire world to see. So that you could get almost any book in a library from the 1800s to 1700s and read it online from these photocopies that were put on Google. Well, now there is this movement that certain material is dangerous, certain material is racist, certain material is homophobic, certain material is hateful and needs to be done away with. And so big companies like Google are erasing just hundreds of thousands of terabytes of data mm -hmm. and we're not even seeing it to get wow. rid of that history so we'll never see it again see the idea was if we can take a picture of these books and we can put these books into a database we no longer have a need for the tangible books so when mm -hmm. libraries shut down in the center of the city either books were thrown away or they were donated where they were eventually ended up you know in a landfill somewhere mm -hmm. those books had uh, information of things that we'll probably never see again outside of the digital format. If you can get rid of the digital format or block the digital format, that's the equivalent of the Moscow, Beijing uh, book burnings that were done during the communist revolution of the 1940s, Terrible. 50s, 60s, and 70s. Terrible. Okay, anyone want to have questions, just unmute your microphone and ask. This has um, been powerful. Eugene, as always, thank you so much for joining but, us and saying this. Before, before someone asks a question, did somebody jump in and ask a question? Because if, if not, I'm going to kind of preempt it and just share something really quick that I believe that the Lord has put on my heart that I would love to share with the people tonight. Sure. Um, sure. I don't want to take up too much time. I know that I've been blabbing now for about a, an hour and a half, but I there is something that I feel that this is th this comes from China. This comes from the Chinese church. This was taught to me by the Chinese church. And I would love to share this with ministry leaders that are studying 
to either be in full-time ministry or they are already in full-time ministry and they want to know how to make you know, their ministry stronger or better or serve God in, in, a, in a better way. And when it, when it comes to questions that I often get from people, um, I'm, I'm often asked about, uh, you know, I'm thinking about going into full-time ministry. What is some of the, what, what's, what's the advice that you would give to me before I step into full-time ministry? Are there any things, are there any special things that you would share with me? Are there any pitfalls? Are there any things that you would warn me of? Are there, are there certain traits or characteristics or tests or, or schools or, um, you know, some sort of training that I need to go through first before I go into full-time ministry? And tonight, just really quick, I would love to share five things that I believe everybody should know before they go into full-time ministry. And these are things that I have picked up inside of China. This comes from the underground house church and observing the underground house church and the way that God has used them to rise up and to participate and be a part of the world's largest revival of our time with more than, more than 28,000 people getting saved every day with so many churches with over a million believers inside of China. Um, when I look to them and I, and I, I look at what I have seen in them, characteristics, traits that I've seen in their church when it comes to full-time ministry, I've seen five things that I think are absolutely necessary for all Christians that are either in full-time ministry discipling those in full-time ministry or are not in full-time ministry and are thinking about going into full-time ministry. Um, and of course, what I'm going to be sharing can be contradicted by so many books and sermons and videos and YouTube videos. I know that there's a lot of material out there about going into ministry, but really there's only one book that's needed. What I love about the Bible is that it covers, you know, thousands of years of information uh, you have different people, different cultures, uh, several characters that are the focus. Uh, you have uh, people that all come from different backgrounds, but they're the, in different times, but they're covered in one book. And we see these individuals, what they had to go through before they chose to serve God full time. And there are five things. The five things, the most, one of the most important things that I usually share with people when they come to me and they ask me about serving in full-time ministry, and I, and, I, and I look at our brothers and sisters in China, and I compare them to the first century church of the New Testament, and I compare them to the fathers of the Old Testament. The number one thing that I share with people is serving the Lord is not a job. Amen. Amen. That's what, what I mean by that. What I mean by that is that ministry should never be looked at as a salaried position with health benefits and a 401k and health insurance and, and all of those. <laughs> it's great. It's great when you have those things. So please, I'm going to be sharing, that, you know, these things are a part of ministry at times, but they should not be the deciding factor ever for you to decide whether you're going to step into full-time ministry or not. If it, this is a part of your decision, if you decide on one ministry position over another because of salary, because of health benefits, because of convenience or comfort levels for you, then you do not belong in ministry. Mm -hmm. If you're evaluating a ministry because of the salary and the salary is lucrative and that's drawing you into ministry, then ministry is not for you. This is one of the most important things that I share with people that are looking for ministry. For us, we do this at Back to Jerusalem. Not one single person. Now, this is not for everybody you know, when I'm talking about this portion of our ministry. But um, we, we have offices in the U.S., Canada. Uh, we're just now launching Brazil and South Korea. Uh, we have offices in Holland, the U.K. But the, whenever I hire anybody to come and work for us, and we have staff all over the world, I have never hired one single person from an advertisement for a paid salary position. The only thing that we offer people that come and work with Back to Jerusalem, one thing that we promise, well, it's two things. It's one thing, but it's kind of separated into two. We offer one single promise 
we offer misery and opportunity. That's it. That's the <laughs> only thing we offer at Back to Jerusalem. But everybody that is that comes and volunteers, when I see that there are individuals that are willing to give their life for the same vision that I'm willing to give my life for, those are individuals that we bring onto our team, and then we find a way to support them financially. But none of the people that are currently working for us ever worked for us because they replied to a salaried position in a, a, a newspaper or they were just looking for an opportunity to serve. And those are the people that I want to serve with. One of the things that I have learned about being in ministry is that it's not much different than my military background. For those of you that don't know me, uh, my background is in the U.S. Marine Corps. I was a scout sniper. I was in special operations. And I would give my life for anybody that I served beside in my platoon in the Marines. And I know, or at least I hope, that the people that I served together with would also give their life for me. When I left the military, I was happy. I found happiness because I currently, on the mission field, I serve with individuals that I love dearly. And I would give my life for any one of the people that I serve with at Back to Jerusalem. And I think, I don't know, <laughs> maybe given the opportunity, they might push me in front of a train, but I think <laughs> that they would also give their life for me. And I've seen many of my friends leave the military and they become so depressed because they miss that commitment and love with another human being. And they don't get that anywhere else in life. But I'm telling you, if you serve God based on the vision that he has given to you, not on what can be benefiting you in ministry, you will find individuals who are sacrifice everything standing beside you. You can give your life for them and they will give their lives for you. So the number one thing that I tell people is serving the Lord is not a job, not in the traditional sense. Um, number two, people that serve the Lord never, never do it for money. You can work for ministry and make money, but you can't work for money and make ministry. Right. You can work for ministry and make money, but you can't work for money and make ministry. If money or comfort or uh, being able to get a regular income into your pocket is a requirement for you to do full-time ministry, you should not do full-time ministry. If you are not willing to sacrifice and, and give up everything, one of the things that we learn over and over and over with Jesus and his disciples is that they all gave up everything to follow after Christ. They were promised nothing. And in fact, one of the things that I love about uh, Christ is that he shows us the sacrifice that he was willing to make and asks that we too make it for those disciples that we are called to go and make. That's the, that's the amazing thing that I think that, that Christ teaches us that sometimes we miss. We, as believers in full-time ministry, are called to make disciples not converts. Uh, it, converts is a completely different thing. We can go and get people to sign a paper. We can hold a big crusade, one night, one event, make everybody feel good, take some Facebook photos, put it up on our advertising materials and make everybody happy and envious. But at the end of the day, that's not making disciples. Making disciples takes sacrifice. It takes time. It takes investment. And there's only so many disciples you can make. Think about Jesus, had 12 disciples, 12 disciples, and he spent three years with those disciples. That's a big investment on 12 people and then, and then losing one. How much more are we also to, called to make that investment? Um, the, so the, the first two things that I always tell people is ministry is not a job. Those that serve the Lord never do it for money. Number three, the Lord will always meet your needs. And so you need to ask yourself, if you're going to go into full-time ministry, you need to ask yourself this third thing that I think is really, really important. Before I go in, even if this is a paid position, even if I get you know, uh, uh, insurance and retirement and I get a really good salary and I get a company car and I get a really posh office and I get a, you know, maybe a, 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 a place to live, before I do any of that, before I accept any of that, would I do this for free? Would I do this for free? If nobody was going to pay me, would I still do it? 
-hmm. or, or better yet, better yet. Here's a, here's an even better one to add on to number three. Would I do it for free or would I, would I pay to do this? Yeah. Would I take money out of my own pocket and do this ministry? Because if you're looking to be in ministry, you need to be willing to sacrifice your own resources at all times to do what God has called you to do. If you would not do it for free and you would not sacrifice your own resources to do it, then the answer is no, you should not be involved in that ministry. Because the, the, the moment you take the very first dollar for the sake of the dollar, not for the sake of the ministry, you're no longer in the, involved in serving the Lord. You are now involved in serving yourself. You're, and I'm not saying you're looking to get rich. I'm not saying you're looking to get wealthy. I'm not saying you're looking to embezzle, but you're seeking comfort. And comfort over God is not ministry. It, 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 it's a selfish uh, thing where we put ourselves before God. You're serving su your own security. Mm -hmm. Number four, because I know the time is limited. I just want to share this. Number four that I usually share with people all the time, never be afraid of poverty. If you're going to go into full-time ministry, never be afraid of poverty. Don't praise it. Don't pray for it. Don't look for it, but don't ever be afraid of it. Right. I mean, for, for me, um, uh, there is a, uh, there, you know, I, I travel very comfortably when I'm flying on airplanes. I stay at rather good hotels. I rent vehicles. Um, I'm staying at, I'm, I'm, right now I'm at my cabin that my wife and I built together uh, in Northern Sweden. We do not suffer in any way financially. But my wife and I have both made a commitment. If ever there is a choice where we have to give up everything that we own. Let us not blink. Let us never buy anything. Let us never build anything that will make us question whether to give it up or not when God comes asking for that sacrifice. Accept it when it comes. Don't reject it because here's the thing. You cannot help poor people by being poor, by right. making yourself poor. You don't multiply helping the poor by making yourself poor. So there's nothing, there's nothing good about making yourself poor, but never be afraid of it. Be ready. If God calls you to give up everything, accept it with joy and rejoice that he has called you to be in that position. Number five, and this is something that whenever you, if you follow those first four things, number five is going to be extremely important for you. Number five, never be intimidated by those wealthier or more famous than you. Because God has called them to be where they're at. He's called you to be where you're at. You are, on e you are equal value before your father. And if he has called you to be there, he's made you, he's put you there for maximum impact for your life. You can't be that person any more than they can be you. But I think sometimes it's kind of in our nature, our human nature, to be intimidated, right? With people that are well-known, authors, writers, preachers, pastors, people that walk around in nice suits. I always tell my wife, honey, if you ever see me in a suit, I'm in the wrong meeting. I, I do. If I, ha if I am required to put on a suit and tie to preach in front of a church, I'm in front of the wrong church. Um, I, and, it's, and I'm not saying that people that wear suit and ties um, are, are bad. I'm just saying that God has called me for who I am. So I'm usually wearing what I'm wearing right now, a pair of cargo khaki pants and you know, some, either a sweater or a Columbia shirt, because that's the field that God has called me in. Now I've gone and sat in some pretty posh offices with some of the most well-known ministries in the world. And I have felt intimidated. I have felt lesser. I have felt like I'm not on the level that they are in the verse that God gave to me that I'd want to share with you. You've heard it many times. I'm not telling you anything new. I'm, I, I believe that I'm only supposed to remind you of what God wants to speak to you tonight. And that is from the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman, a workman. So I believe that sometimes we can be intimidated if we are in a blue collar area or in an area where 
people are they 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 have to work for a living and they're not a part of the the intellectual crowd the academic crowd the the those that are in charge of factories not working at the factories i love it when it was written to timothy a workman needeth not be ashamed but rightly dividing the word of truth. We don't have to be ashamed <clears throat> for the calling that God has given to us. And when I go on trips into remote areas, let me just share this really quick. Um, whenever I travel into Sudan, I've been in, I've been in the middle of Sudan and I've had my car break down. I tell you, if I was given the choice, would I rather be with a Chinese pastor that has worked his entire life in a mechanic shop or to be with a pastor from America that just graduated from seminary. There are few things in this world as useless as someone who's only been to seminary <laughs> when you're on the mission field. <laughs> it's really? great to have someone who has, that knows how to build things, that knows how, to, that, that knows how mechanics works, that, that knows how to work with their hands. A workman needs not be ashamed. So when looking at full-time ministry, I would encourage you to encourage other people that they can start at any time. This week, we just had our ambassadors meeting and we just had our hackers conference. At our hackers conference, I had people from all over the world. I had people from CIA, military intelligence. I had the very cyber warfare team from the Air Force that, was, that discovered the hacking of the DNC emails. So they every day they are involved in catching hackers from... Uh, Russia and China. I had the guy that created, if you guys are familiar with uh, ExpressVPN, the guy that, that invented ExpressVPN, he was there with us. Um, we had people from so many backgrounds. I had one guy that created a ministry application for your phone. It's really powerful. It's called United Hive. Um, it is a ministry application. You put it on your phone and you can see people doing ministry all around you. Go and join them or even share your own testimony. And he came to me this week and he said, brother, I work in the finance sector full time. And I really feel that God is calling me into full time ministry. And I stopped him and I said, what's the difference? Yeah. You can, you're involved in full time finance. Yeah. Now, if God calls you to leave the finance and do something else with more of your time, then so be it. But you do not have to leave your job. All of the people that we had working with us at the Hackers Conference that helped us develop. So I, I, actually, I can't go into the details of the things that we're developing right now. They're so stinking cool. I'm so excited about these new gadgets that, that, that they're making. Um, but they're all full-time. I, I can't tell you one. So I'll, I'll tell you one. Uh, two guys run their own uh, cyber warfare unit. Um, they're the ones that set up all of the cyber security for, um, uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, they, they're, they're the ones that help a lot of the big politicians right now today. They said, Eugene, we are going to use our software, put it on your computer so that you and anybody that you work with will be, will be able to find out right away if you are being infiltrated or attacked by in any sort of, uh, a cyber unit inside of China or Iran or anywhere else you go. We're going to do that for you for free as a, as a, a service to the work that the Chinese are doing uh, in closed countries. Wow. They're not leaving their job. This is, no. this is what God has called them to do. So they don't have to leave their job to be in, involved in full-time ministry. And during business as mission, I would love an opportunity to share about. Uh, oh, yeah, we have you back for that. Yeah, so, so the, the business as mission that we focus on are people that they take on jobs that allow them opportunities to serve in some of the most closed countries in the world, like Iran and Yemen and Somalia and Sudan. And they do not have a church building. They do not stand on podiums and preach messages where people are freely coming to them on a week by week basis, but they are engaged in business, handling orders every single week and ministering to people that they're working with every single week. They get opportunities that are endless and their ministry will never leave the, the, the business as mission model. They will always be ministering in the business as mission model, not being paid, not being uh, supported, not being entitled to some sort of uh, uh, title or salary 
as a pastor, evangelist, um, prophet, prophetess, whatever. Not saying that those are bad. I'm just saying that please don't close your mind to the idea that full-time ministry excludes any full-time work in the secular world. Sometimes they're one in the same. One of our, excuse me uh, for interrupting, one of our people asked um, those five points that you listed, do you, can you email those to us to share with everyone? Yeah, or absolutely. Yeah, yes, great. I can. I don't have the information that I just shared. I kind of wrote them down point by point. And so the, you'll just have the notes from this video, I guess, but I can send you the points, the five yeah, points. Yeah, we certainly uh, uh, agree with that. A, a lot of times for, for CMM, we, we rely a lot on faith and volunteers and that scripture, Psalm 1103, in the day of your power, God will raise up your volunteers and you'll have the due of your youth. So um, we can certainly I see a lot of sinking up there between back to Jerusalem and CMM also. And we're also very, very much um, marketplace people that wherever you are, you need to shine, you need to do whatever God's doing. We had Evans Powell speaking last night on that very thing, didn't we? Yeah, it was powerful. A lot of what you just said the last uh, 20 minutes, Eugene, was just like what we heard last night from a guy from the Tidewater area of Virginia, one of our students and uh, he's earned his doctoral degree this year too and he works for the shipyard and how he's in the marketplace as a as a, as a pastor and a teacher so to speak um, and working on the engineering side of the turbines for submarines and power generation plants and and how that's where god called him to be so he had a great presentation lots of scriptures to just talk about you know even daniel fell in love with nebuchadnezzar you know, we don't have to all just be ministering inside the church walls or employed inside the church walls to be in ministry. We can be in full-time ministry, and like Daniel was, serving Nebuchadnezzar, and he grew to love Nebuchadnezzar, even though Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm putting you in charge of all the magicians, and <laughs> Evan shared a funny uh, account of what he recalls with Daniel going back to God and saying, why did you have to put me in charge of the magicians? <laughs> But it was really a good analogy, a good, a good story for everyone. So great yeah. points. Yeah, we see the same with uh, King Cyrus. Um, not necessarily uh, a, 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 a Jew or following God, but definitely carried out the orders of God. And th those that were called to be with Esther. I mean, we see that, you know, the full-time connection, the, the, the power and ministry. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of examples that I want to share during business as mission. Amen. And look at President Trump. I mean, he's, he goes wild on Twitter. Um, he's far from perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. But look at the righteous fruit of what he's in position for. And yeah. I know somebody yeah. asked me in early 2016 what his odds were. And I said, he doesn't have a snowball chance in Hades, <laughs> you know. But by October, hear the Lord speaking to me on a plane come back from Greece. When you speak to Mr. Trump, call him President Trump. And, hey, I can be wrong, and I love to be proven wrong. But, Lord, it has to be your light that illuminates my heart and changes my heart. Amen. To keep my eyes on Jesus. Amen. Amen. So powerful. Anything else? you? Oh, Eugene, I wanted to put a plug in for dingdash.com. Most of us have heard of it, but maybe not everybody. And we'll, we'll send uh, messages out and emails, but maybe take two minutes to talk about dingdash.com as a social media alternative. Yeah, sure. So dingdash.com, thank you for allowing me a chance to share. We haven't really pushed uh, it anywhere else. We wanted to make this social media experience available for people that live in the 1040 window in the area between China and Jerusalem. So they're the main focus. We did a soft launch in November of last year. Uh, the main uh, push was going to be India. Um, unfortunately, we had some persecution take place in India the week before our meetings. So we didn't get a lot of people that, uh, that we were able to share with about dingdash.com, but it's fine uh, because we continued to develop it. Uh, so it's up, it's running, it's bare bones, basic uh, social media. So you are able to connect with people directly on the field and share things at free will. So we don't, um, 
block people from uh, sharing Christian point of view. Uh, we don't uh, bombard people with propaganda. Uh, we allow people to completely erase all of their information. Um, a lot of social media sites like Facebook, Twitter, once you're on there, even when you delete all of your stuff, if they still have record, they're allowed to use their records of your information from the past. Um, they also bombard you with a lot of uh, propaganda. They also block, e even if you don't know about it, you might be shadow banned. Uh, yeah. Shadow banning is really big right now on, uh, by Facebook on a lot of their users. I work with pe people from Facebook. In fact, um, during this hackers conference that we had last week, one of our main people there helping us to develop um, uh, an audio Bible, a really cool audio Bible that is a, um, it's a it looks like a pen but it is a uh, self um, uh, charging uh, audio Bible. Uh, the person Perfect. helping us write the software for that is uh, from Google. So she's one of the main code writers for Google. Um, so I, we know that there's shadow banning taking place against Christians on Google, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Um, and so we wanted to create a platform where Christians could go to at the moment it seems that there doesn't, there's not a lot of, um, of uh, people feeling like they need to leave current social media. So some people are happy with Instagram. Some people are happy with Facebook. But for those that will not be in the future, we want to create an experience with dingdash.com that people can use, communicate, and not feel blocked. Anytime they, if we're shut down or blocked, we're able to readjust quick, pretty quickly. Um, we got some really great hackers. And here's one of the important things with dingdash.com. With dingdash.com, uh, we're able to operate in countries where other social media is blocked. So right. this they, allows they, us an opportunity. Yeah. Hey, we only got like four minutes left. Does anybody have a, a last minute question? And then uh, Jerry Wickline, thanks for joining in. If you could close us out in prayer right at uh, four o'clock, three o'clock your time. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Peggy. Just, I don't know if you can do this in four minutes, <laughs> but um, I, am I mistaken that earlier you said that you, when you were talking about not hearing reports from the pastors on the ground about any of their members being um, affected by the virus, did you say that the one pastor had a church of 10 million? And um, if that's true, I'm interested in hearing about what the structure of a church of 10 million people is and how that executes and is facilitated. Yes, you heard me correctly. A church of 10 million, that's very easy to, to look up even when I'm not explaining it. So I've written a couple books. Um, it, they're available online. One of them is called I Stand with Christ. That is about Pastor Zhang Rong Liang. He's the most famous pastor in all of China. I Stand with Christ. He has a he has a, um, uh, a church of over 10 million believers. If you look it up on YouTube, they say at least 10 million believers. Another pastor, the pastor of the China Gospel Fellowship, Pastor Shin, is a very good friend of mine. I wrote his biography uh, together with him. That one's called Kidnapped by a Cult. Um, that gives you how it started how, in his church also. So both of those pastors, those two pastors alone, if you look them up on Wikipedia, Pastor Shin, Pastor Zhang Rong Liang, those two pastors, are, they are considered the founders of two of the world's largest um, uh, uh, Christian denominations. So they're, they're, their churches are considered to be denominations by themselves. They're so big. They have more people in their church than we have in this country where I'm at right now. Um, uh, so you can understand their structure and how they're operating. Uh, and there's another book that I put out called The Underground Church. The Underground Church, that book also um, shares about the structure, how you have a church so big, how did it get to be so big, and how do you control or, you know, administer uh, or preach or become a pastor of a church that big. So yeah, you didn't mishear me. That, that's correct. That's why I feel like I have a pretty good feel, not because I have good contacts, but I have the, these pastors that I've been serving with for 20 years, they have pretty large networks. So if anybody knows, you know, a little bit about their area, I mean, I can do a survey in five seconds with these guys. So I don't have to do, you know, I don't have to uh, go around, you know, with questionnaires at grocery stores trying to connect with people. 
um, we have our, our kind of our own ecosystem inside of China. Uh, with mm -hmm. the pastors that we're connected with at Back to Jerusalem, uh, we probably represent more than 70, 80 million believers. Amen. Okay, great. So, um, and we encourage you to go to backtojerusalem.org and sign up for everything there, be on their mailing list to stay informed. And also subscribe to Eugene's podcast on the BTK website because uh, we all need to hear the truth and righteousness prevail. So, Jerry, let's close out in prayer. And thank you so much, Eugene, and everybody for coming. Thank you, Eugene. Thank, thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. I loved it. Love being with you guys. Love you guys. Praise God. Thank you, Eugene. Father, we just thank you that you are a God of power and might, and you're omnipresent and omnipotent and omni. Uh, What's the other big word? Uh, Omnipresent. Omnipresent. Yeah, that's good. I don't. I know two big words: typewriter and watermelon. So anyway, hillbilly. So God, we we thank you that you are in charge, and let us know that. Let us feel that. We thank you for all Eugene's doing. I pray for his uh, uh, safety, his more and more God. Uh, God ideas that, that you've deposited in the man. We thank you for what you've given us today. We pray we go away with it and even get more. And we ask your blessings on each one listening that we would become everything you've anointed us and pointed us and purposed us to be even before we came to this planet, that we would bloom and blossom and grow and become everything that you have called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you all. We love you. We'll see you soon.